Well, welcome to the Right to Food panel. My name is Olivier Deschuter. I'm the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Food. And I would like to say, first of all, that um, since uh, 1996, the World Food Summit, and especially since the adoption of the uh, voluntary guidelines on the progressive realization of the right to food in the context of national food security, which have been adopted in 2004, the right to food has been making tremendous progress in a number of regions, particularly in Latin America, but now increasingly in Africa and in Asia. And that is very encouraging for, for two reasons, because the right to food has two key contributions to make to uh, the fight against food insecurity and, and poverty and to the, the development um, of the post-2015 agenda. First, the right to food means that the promises that governments make that they shall move towards sustainable development and the reduction of, of poverty are promises that shall have to be kept. Why? Well, because the right to food establishes accountability mechanisms, um, councils in which civil society organizations can ask from governments that they justify their choices, and because the right to food requires that whichever progress is made is monitored by independent bodies on the basis of indicators that will allow to track progress and to increase the pressure on governments uh, so that they deliver on the promises that they make. And I think part of the reason why the Millennium Development Goals adopted in 2000 were not sufficiently uh, implemented is because we lacked such accountability mechanisms, we lacked um, a, a mechanism by which the governments would pay uh, the political cost it should um, uh, entail not to comply with their commitments. The second reason why the right to food seems to me extremely important as a tool is because it is a governance uh, instrument that favors participation. You see, in, in development discussions, we have for many years been uh, hesitating between two essential approaches. One is a very top-down technocratic approach in which grand plans are adopted uh, to be implemented then in, in various contexts, but designed uh, by, by technocrat international agencies without really the people concerned, the beneficiaries uh, being involved in, in designing and implementing these schemes. Or then we have market-based solutions, incentives that try to um, incentivize um, people, organizations, business companies to do the right thing, uh, but this neglects the fact that the market is often very myopic, it doesn't take into account the long-term considerations, and it serves demand that is solvent. It doesn't respond to the needs of the poorest people whose purchasing power is too low to even uh, interest the business community. And so the right to food is there to move beyond this top-down approach or this market-based um, um, set of solutions. The right to food is about participation. It's about seeking the views of those who must benefit from whichever initiatives are adopted, whichever policies are designed, in order to make sure that these initiatives are well targeted, respond to real needs, are gradually improved by seeking the response of people, the feedback from people, so that we can gradually learn from what they have to say about the way they are impacted or instead excluded from the schemes that are designed. And for this reason, the right to food has um, also this, this second function to fulfill. It's a tool that helps to accelerate collective learning, helps us to learn about our mistakes, to better focus our strategies and to succeed in the fight against poverty. The right to food, in other terms, is much more today than a symbol. It's much more than just a legal commitment. It's an operational tool that can improve significantly our work towards sustainable development and against poverty and food insecurity.